so I'm going to start uh, with a, an introduction to dengue and give us a, a little bit more um, uh, information that, so that we can follow along with the talks that will come later. This was us uh, last year in uh, COVID free times and we were able to get together in the Eichmann Center uh, and uh, kick off our first uh, inaugural meeting here. So dengue disease is a, a disease of the uh, tropical regions. Nearly half of the world is at risk. And these regions are, are the, where we find dengue because of the mosquitoes that transmit the disease. So we have Aedes aegypti, which is the, the main transmitting mosquito, uh, but also Aedes albopictus. And this mosquito is the vector and moves the virus from one human to the next. Southeast Asia uh, has the largest number of infections and it also has the, the largest uh, number of deaths. And so this is a, an area where we should be thinking about uh, doing the most that we can to deal with this disease. For your information, the, the humans, uh, we, we get the virus from an infection uh, an infected mosquito. It transmits the virus into your blood and probably there's a little bit of uh, virus replication at the site of the, of, the, of the bite, the mosquito bite. The virus then uh, moves into your bloodstream and you end up with this uh, uh, viremia about a, a few days later, up to a week later. And for the virus, that's the end of the story. At this point, while there's lots of virus in your blood, you need to be bitten again by a, a second mosquito and the, and the virus then leaves and transmits via this mosquito. But unfortunately for humans, that's not the end of the story. While the, the virus leaves and the, the viremia drops, the hospital phase and the disease starts. And this is why we have problem of dengue disease. WHO classified this into uh, various outcomes. Dengue virus infection leads to multiple outcomes. And you can see that the classifications start with these asymptomatics or, and also this undifferentiated fever or viral syndrome. And this can easily be confused with other virus infections. Originally, we would think of, of influenza, but maybe COVID, which also has the similar viral fever at the very start. So this is the stage where we need to start knowing it's dengue and it's difficult to identify at that stage. Back in 2009, WHO improved these guidelines and started talking about identifying dengue early. So looking for these warning signs. And the reason for this is so that you can identify dengue and treat early and trying to prevent or treat better severe dengue disease. Unfortunately, the warning signs are not perfect, and even those without warning signs might still end up with severe dengue. And that's why we need to keep a close eye on this disease. This is work also done from the London School in, in uh, Indonesia. And here they're looking to describe the use of uh, modified mosquitoes, the Wolbachia infected mosquitoes, to see whether this can be used to prevent those transmission chains. Here, though, we're just looking at the annual incidence of, of dengue across Indonesia, and you can see that there are hotspots, those, those places in red where there's more dengue than the other places. And in fact, if you look closer, you can see that 10 cities account for most of the dengue burden across Indonesia. So we know that this is a disease of, of cities. But interestingly, within those cities, you know, where is the mosquito biting you? We traditionally think of the mosquito biting you in your house, and at home. However, it may also be that there are infected mosquitoes at your school or your neighbor or your workplace. And these may also be causing transmission. And for prevention, that's a difficulty. One interesting thing is that we might learn more about this during the COVID lockdowns because people might be confined more to their home. Will that have a big impact on uh, dengue disease? And we might hear more about that later. So just moving on to the virus, it's a, a positive strand virus with this uh, uh, capsular E-dimer capsula around the outside, which is what the immune response is mostly to. 
And recognizing this virus during the disease is, is difficult because as I've pointed out, the viremia stage, we should look for the virus, but actually at the disease stage, it's often the immune response that we need to identify. So we need a combination of diagnostics and we'll hear more about that in the next talk. This is complicated because there are four distinct dengue viruses and also some relation to other viruses, uh, other flaviviruses, such as uh, Zika. Those four dengue viruses mean you can be infected four separate times. And while genetically those four uh, viruses are quite distinct, immunologically, there's a little bit of uh, overlap there. So that means that your order of your infections, your first infection followed by your second, might depend on which of these particular viruses you've had, and maybe some combinations are gonna be worse than others. So your first infection here on the, on the left, we can see we can detect virus in the early stage and the IgM and maybe IgG later. But in your second infection, that response is different. You have some memory IgG and that boosts that, that level here and your IgM might be a bit smaller. So again, making the, the diagnosis difficult. This is my work back in 2014 now, where we tried to explain how that second uh, antibody response might lead to more disease. And here we are showing that the, there is a co-receptor that matches the virus. And under these circumstances, you lead to this antibody dependent enhancement or increased virus replication due to this uh, uh, virus mechanism. So in summary, what happens if you have plenty of, of antibody, you completely neutralize the virus. Uh, and the virus is killed. But if you only have a little bit of virus, as in the, vi the antibodies left over from a previous infection, this can lead to the uh, virus entering the cell and replicating more effectively and leading to more virus particles and more severe disease as a result. So one of the consequences of this, uh, of this enhancement is that when the vaccine was introduced for dengue, we can see here from the uh, New England Journal paper, those participants who are uh, under five years old had an increased risk of disease. So the relative risk here is 7.45. And work done at the, at the London School showed that the uh, vaccination process was acting like a, an individual vac uh, infection. So an unvaccinated person, a normal dengue disease progress, you can see that the uh, primary disease has some risk of severe disease, the secondary has the most risk, and your third and fourth infection is, is typically more mild. But if you're vaccinated, you might skip that primary infection, but then go straight on to your second uh, like disease. And under ideal conditions, you've already had the disease, you get vaccinated, and then you miss that secondary disease. So then in uh, you, this is the where you move, go directly from your vaccine, which gives you a mild um, uh, response, and then straight into your uh, post-secondary like disease process. This has led to a change in the vaccine requirements. And so now WHO recommends that you only take the vaccine if you already have a history of the virus infection, dengue virus infection. I want to just mention now, uh, last year we talked about Zika. So the Zika was the virus of the year for me. And this is uh, where I described uh, an outbreak of, of Zika in Singapore. And you can see that uh, by a concerted effort across Singapore, we were able to control the virus, but it's not completely eradicated and it's still there in the background. We also talked about the possibility that because of the similarity between the Zika uh, Zika and dengue, you might have a, a Zika infection and then your first dengue infection might be behaving as this second response and you might get more severe disease. And in fact, I'm pleased to see now that there's uh, work from uh, South America, which has now sh uh, also shown this. And so your Zika infection might lead to an enhancement of your dengue infection. So we know that there are uh, difficult relationships between the viruses. And I just, of course, this year, uh, our new virus is SARS-CoV-2, uh, and this will be talk of the discussions today. 
So my work on, on SARS-CoV-2 is looking at the, uh, uh, the viral sequencing and trying to understand about this spike protein around the outside of the virus and whether that might change your immune response. And I think here there's a nice review talking about the, the hot topic of the moment, uh, whether the antibodies to your uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus last very long and whether you can get a reinfection at some later date. There's a little bit of evidence to suggest that this might be the case on occasion, but we don't know how common it is. And maybe as the antibodies drop, your risk of a second infection become higher. We do know that the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus uses the spike protein to interact with the human ACE2 and use it as a receptor. Uh, and this recept uh, spike receptor binding is much better for COVID-2 than it was for this original SARS virus. And I think there is some speculation here about whether or not that antibody enhancement that we saw with dengue might or might not happen with uh, Zika, either directly through the antibody binding or potentially through the viral surface protein alterations as we've seen with, with dengue. But I think this is out for discussion and I don't think we have uh, a lot of evidence yet. But we might hear more about that. So just in conclusion, some final thoughts. Uh, dengue is increasingly common across the tropical world, urbanization, you know, due to urbanization and travel. No effective vaccine or therapy yet. I'm hoping this will come soon. But the current dengue vaccine you know, may cause in, increased disease in those people who have not been exposed to dengue previously. Uh, we should therefore concentrate on detecting dengue early and giving supportive therapy early. Meanwhile, control is based around uh, uh, mosquito control at the moment. And uh, just to say thank you for Astra for funding the London School and of course the Eichmann for uh, working together with us on all of this work. So thank you. <laughs>